post-independent Nigeria was handed the parliamentary system of government by the British colonial masters, the same system of government in Britain at the time of Nigeria's emancipation. In this system of government, the principle of separation of power, especially between the executive and the lawmaking arm, the legislature, is not always obvious. It's a system whereby, you know, the parliament operates as both a legislative arm and from among the parliament, you equally have the head of government. What it means is that the prime minister is both a lawmaker and the executive you know, officer, the chief executive, because whatever is happening in the parliament, he is part of it. The system developed from the principle of uh, not concentrating too much powers in the hands of one man, it's, it's, it's developed from the understanding that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the need to um, separate powers and get the people's representative to govern them is an underlying uh, principle uh, that gave rise to the pluralism of government. Scholars are of the opinion that because of the peculiarities of the newborn nation at the time, certain aspects of the system she inherited from her colonial masters and used from 1954 and even after independence were abandoned shortly after the coup in 1966. The long, you know, run of the implementation of, the, of, the, of, of that uh, system, the use of that system in, you know, the governance of Nigeria, uh, beginning from the last couple of years of colonial rule uh, till the first six years or five, five years plus uh, of independence, uh, the system was used. The coup truncated not just the uh, use of the parliamentary system of government, but also the um, First Republic, civilian government. Uh, the military came in the wake of the coup and governed Nigeria from that January the 16th, 1966, until October the 1st, 1979. During those years, uh, Nigeria didn't have a civilian rule. Nigeria was governed by different military governments. First, that of uh, Aguin Rossi, and then um, we had uh, General Gowon, and then in between, we had Murtla Mohammed, and then General Luce Gorbasanjo. It was not the coup, actually, that made us to abandon the system because we still had an opportunity to, you know, continue the system in 1975 when arrangements were made for a new civilian government to be handed over to for the Second Republic. But the committee that was set up by government to recommend, you know, a system of government for Nigeria for the Second Republic, in their wisdom or unwisdom, recommended the adoption of the American-style presidential system. The presidential system of government, on the other hand, is a democratic and republican system where the head of government is elected across the country, which is distinct and separate from the legislative arm who are elected in their constituencies and senatorial districts. Now, having experienced these two systems of government, how do they work for a heterogeneous nation like Nigeria? As at the time we practiced that system, obviously you had lesser people in government. And in terms of cost, it was more beneficial to the state. In terms of decision, it, it is more speedy to take decisions. And it is easier to sail through in terms of bills and the rest of it. You know, but coming to the presidential system, in the area of cost, it is enormous, so massive. At the end of the day, looking at the, the, the resources with which these two systems are managed, and the decisions that emanate from them. I, do, I have not seen where the decisions in the presidential system are of a higher quality. So what is the basis of running a system that is so enormous in terms of you know, financial application, while the quality of delivery is not different from what you find in parliamentary? Today, Nigeria has more than 90 political parties, and like Dr. Ikeri and Professor Awarawo have said, the country runs one of the most expensive presidential system of government, where about just less than 10% of elected and appointed officials corner about 90% of the nation's resources. 
what needs to give? How can we evolve a more people-centric government 60 years on? Now, what a, a president will need to do to emerge, it makes, I mean, it's so, so demanding. He has to spend so much money, make so many promises to so many people, try to reconcile conflicting, you know, opinions and interests. In fact, a, the presidential system is such that by the time you go through all that it takes for you to become president, it is difficult to get a competent and honest person as president because you have to concede to so many people. The corrupt people may have money. You need to, you know, reconcile with them and promise them and things like that. And I, I, would, I, would, I would say that one of the contradictions of governance in Nigeria has revolved around our adoption of the presidential system of government. The other side to it is the tendency for that system to create, you know, authoritarian individuals. If somebody has the proclivity for being authoritarian and dictatorial, the British system encourages that because almost absolute powers are confined, conferred in the hands of the executive president. Unlike the parliamentary system where the manager is a member of parliament, he emanates from parliament, and checks and balances are stronger. People talk about democracy as if it is it's a heavenly something, that once it comes, the paradise has arrived. And we try to copy systems that we are not familiar with. When you look at the origin of those who are said to have been the first to practice democracy, the Greeks, the system they practiced is not what is being practiced in the United States. It's not what is being practiced in Britain. They decided to adopt or adapt the system to their own ontological reality. So if we must practice democracy, which we should, I'm not against democracy, but we must practice it in line, we must practice it in line with our own realities. You know, for them, for the Greeks, it was not about election. So what was critical to them was the right to, participation, to participate in policy making. Now, but when the United States looked at it, considering their reality in terms of population and all the other issues, they decided to adapt it. And that is where the question of representation came in. Because they will not be able to operate it the way the Greeks did, looking at their size. They decided to adapt the system to their own reality. Now, if we must practice democracy, for the, U the United States and the rest of them, election is a crucial factor. And in that election, the winner takes all. You see, but we have our own lifestyle. We have our traditional values. This is a world where that is not a usual thing. This idea of the winner takes call is one of the major reasons why there is all manner of you know, crisis in governance. Because take, for instance, a situation whereby election is conducted and the winner scores maybe 55% of the total votes. Maybe the, the, the second best will now get maybe 40%, and uh, then you distribute the other to other parties. Now, would you say that the 40%, those who voted for that person, the 40%, do have a stake? And so we must embrace a system that will be able to take care of our needs. And that is that there should be no, oh, you, the winner takes all. Let there be what you can call something close to a unity government, where everybody is brought to bear, depending essentially on the level of popularity. So. The man who scored 40 should be equally or uh, should be made to be part of the government because his interests will be covered by virtue of his presence in governance. Nigeria needs a robust and a decisive process of national integration. Right now, um, if we say we are cohesive, uh, we are not telling the truth. Um, centrifugal forces are far, far, far more uh, wide-ranging at this time than those that, you know, unite us. Um, I've, you know, made this statement a couple of times. Right now, we need an agency for national integration. Nigeria needs to be integrated. And, you know, we need to be committed to... Once we are not integrated, once we are not, we are not, we are not working towards the same purpose, you know, our developmental processes who can, you know, will, will be retarded. Indeed. Promoting a true sense of national integration is one that requires urgency as Nigeria marks 60 years of independence amid unrest, ethnic and regional tensions.
There have been efforts, no doubt, but why are they not yielding the desired results? It all falls right back to conversations around the kind of governance that will best address the needs and interests of the people collectively. Felicity Ezewike for Plus TV Africa.